Hi, welcome to The Building Doctor Show. I am your host, Jens Johansson. If you're watching this, you're watching episode 22, which falls right in the Christmas week. So what we've done today is record the best of our topics and speakers for this past year so that you can enjoy it anytime during this holiday season because we want you spending time with your family, friends, and loved ones instead of coming to this live webinar. So this is gonna be a compilation of our best speakers, our best topics over this past year, and we hope you enjoy it and you can watch it anytime you choose to. We really appreciate you watching today's episode. And as always, please leave your questions or comments in the link and we'll get to them in the next live show. Also, be sure to register in the description below so that you don't miss the next episode and you get access to our entire library of recorded shows. If you like what you see in this episode, be sure to give it a like and be sure to share it with your fellow board members or friends who live in other condos to help them and help us spread the word. As we celebrate the holiday season, we wanted to give a heartfelt thanks to you, our audience, for tuning in all year and trusting us with your questions about your building and how to make a better community for you to live in. We look forward to answering your questions in 2024 and beyond and providing you with help, hope, and happiness into next year. Thank you. Difference between the unit policy and the master policy, who owns what, whose insurance should cover what, is there language in each policy about what it covers or does not cover? And I think one of the questions that this gets to is the bylaws will say the common areas of the building, the studs, the framing, the floor joists, the insulation between the units, that's all owned by the you know association. But then we have insurance policies that are working between the drywall, so to speak, but then some, you know, better insurance policies, yeah, I'll cover everything. It was my guy's loss or other policies, you know, they may say different things. So how do we filter that? How do we make sure that we have the right coverage? How do we make sure the right people are paying the right, you know, look to them to do what they're supposed to do? Yeah, fair enough. So I'll start with the master policies um, and not to get too far into the woods on the detail because there's so many details, but, but if, if, if the master policy is written correctly, and I mean that whoever is evaluating it actually goes out and looks at it and mm -hmm. measures the buildings and finds out that you have an elevator and two pools and a pool house. And, you know, so it, it, the, the, my personal opinion is that if you're going to write it, you need to know what's there. So go out and do that. If the master policy is adequately, the coverage amounts and all that stuff, that should be reviewed annually. And um, sometimes I won't get into a, a big deal with, but 10 years ago, um, a lot of companies, came, well, a few companies came out with what we call skeleton master policies. Mm -hmm. And they really What's, are, what they is really, that? well, it's, it's, we call it an all in policy versus a skeleton policy. The all in policy basically says we cover everything, everything in the building. And that means, again, we're going to go back to this, everything from the drywall in. So if the bylaws don't state, you know, something to counter what the all-in policy says, then you have a contract, you know, that there's a contract between the insurance company and the association. So if the bylaws aren't clear, then mm -hmm. that, that master policy could be paying for everything, even right. the furnishings in the building. So that's where the, where the bylaws come in and, and kind of whittle that down and say, look, we just want to pay for, I call the superstructure. So if it's evaluated properly and it's reviewed annually, the master policy should be in great shape, have a high deductible. That's fine. And it should work in concert with the HO6 or the unit owner's policy. So mm -hmm. that if the owner has a, a claim or a loss that is confined to their unit and inside the drywall, there's no need for the master policy to get involved. If, right the fire goes through the ceiling into the persons above them, then you potentially could have a unit owner's policy downstairs, a unit owner's policy upstairs, and the master policy to fix what's in between, as mm -hmm. long as the bylaws are specific about what's in between. Okay. So that I, that's a, that's a 30,000 foot view, and you're gonna hear this over and over again today, bylaws, 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 <laughs> bylaws, yeah. hire an attorney, to sit down with an insurance person and make sure that all the I's are dotted. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. You'll, like yeah. I said, when you're sitting in front of a judge at a bench trial or a jury, or you're doing a deposition, you will never be sorry that you spent the money to get the bylaws updated. Yeah, big time, big time. So bylaws updated, and that, that brings up a question. I don't, I don't read a whole ton of them, but when I do, I see 30% of them were the original bylaws. And of course, they benefit the developer because the developer owns the units at the time, and they've never been updated. And you know, there it was before you know a computer was developed, and the type spacing <laughs> is just the air off. And right. you're like, holy moly, they hadn't even thought about multiple outlets in the bathroom yet. And uh, so there's lots of bylaws. <laughs> there's talk about skeleton. They don't even represent the right interests. Sure. And so if we've had previous shows about that, but it's just here is one more expert on the building doctor show telling you, hey, revisit that uh, and just look at it and tighten it up. And this is something probably every five to 10 years that needs to be done. So it's not not every year, not every policy, but right. <clears throat> get a good do you ever see any boards being super proactive saying hey we've gone through this exercise here's what all of you residents should get yeah i wrote i wrote a um, association up in whatcom county because i can't write them in king pearson snohomish anymore but Mm -hmm. i wrote one up there and a year later i sat down with them and i read the thing cover to cover and i said here's what i would suggest within a month all the changes were done Wow, and they're Fantastic. like they're like okay. I mean, it's not a big one. It's probably gosh, what is it? Oh, twenty units or something like that. So okay. it wasn't huge, but they they were like, yeah, we don't want to be burdened with this if something right. happens. Right. Yep. So. Yep. It's time to do it now. Okay. Yep. Great. How pricing works. So we're going to talk mainly about building envelope consultants or architects or engineers, but we'll also talk, you know, you have other partners in this too, like, uh, you know, managers or lawyers or contractors. And so it's good to talk about the different types because you might have four partners with four different pricing structures or kind of agreements there. And so architects traditionally have said, you know what, you know, eight to 12% of construction costs. I will design everything and manage the contractor for you, pick out all the pick out all the you know light fixtures and things like that. And at the at each payment, I will take a 10% fee on whatever the contractor is charging. Um, managers, you, you, you can look at your management agreement. It's usually a management agreement to manage your property, not to run a multi-million dollar insurance repair project. And so it would make sense that you need to pay them an additional fee to look at all the checks, be in all the meetings, run, you know, various other vendors and partners through your project. So look in the agreement you have with them. Typically, it's some kind of set fee, again, based on contract cost, but it could be based on other things as well. Lawyers, if you're working with lawyers, we're all familiar with the contingency fee, which means if I, you know, it's contingent upon what I recover. So if I, if we win the case and I recover some money, I take a chunk of that and give you the rest. So it's a little different because it's not related to construction project cost, but it could be a cost that you see in this uh, process. And then contractors usually are working on kind of a set fee. I will replace your roof for $300,000. And so they they say what they're going to do. They'll include or exclude. Uh, If we open up the roof and find a bunch of rot, I'm going to charge you more for that, you know, damaged wood and, and replacing those things. But they'll have, you know, ways to work through the pricing. And so... We get, we get these different types of cost, lump sum or set fee. Think of it like the price sticker that's on your clothes. You can get this shirt for $20. So that is a set fee, okay? Uh, time and cost, you'll hear cost versus materials. In the consultant world, you'll hear time and cost because we don't have any materials. But in the construction world, you'll hear time and materials. What does that mean? So... However long I'm out there, that's my time of labor. And then whatever my you know material costs are, time and materials, time and cost. So in a consultant thing of cost, we may have 
there may be some travel fees or mileage fees. There may be some printing of big blueprints or, you know, permit fees, things like that. So here's the fee or here's the cost and here's our time involved in that. And then we talked about percentage or contingency. So again, design percentage or architectural percentage or lawyer contingency. Uh, managers can be in that percentage as well. And then there's a there's kind of a hybrid of cost plus or negotiated contract. And that you'll see that in some kind of negotiated construction work, which basically means whatever my costs are, here's all my receipts and give me a markup on top of that as my profit margin. And so it's it's an it's an open book way to kind of track things and look at things. It it, it gets complicated. It requires some more administrative. Uh, work, but it it has a niche, it has a use, but by far we see things on the set fee basis, we see things on the time and cost basis, and then a little bit of the percentage basis. Kelly, would you add anything to how kind of this, you know, how this works? Um, no, I mean, that covers it pretty well. I would say that, um, you know, we're going to get into this a little more in depth, but, uh, you know, Specifically at J2 and with consultants in general, we do tend to write the bigger project proposals in different phases, and those mm -hmm. different phases can have different types of costs yeah, for very specific reasons. And like I said, we'll get into that, but it's something that definitely you want to pay mind to when you're reviewing your proposals. When to call your an, your attorney, and so here's here's some bullet points, and I think one of the first ones is, so it's a lot like we'll say as consultants, you don't need a consultant to do to paint the fence. Just call a painter, take care of it. And so this first one is, look, I'm, you're not here to do the first steps of you know negotiating and issuing notices and things like that. But now that we're on step three or four, now we can bring an attorney in, and so. Is it, this gets back to the efficiency question of you're not doing all the work for these people and they can't abdicate everything of management to you, but talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, I think an important part of, you know, this, this first point uh, addresses either collection or enforcement issues typically. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important in a in an association for the board to follow the processes set forth in their governing documents. So there's usually like an enforcement or collection policy. And if it's really not an emergency, it's quite unfair to an owner to, you know, to have like one notice sent and who knows what happened. Maybe they missed it in the mail. Sometimes that happens. Um, but then all of a sudden they're, you know, they're hearing from an attorney and mm -hmm. that feels quite unreasonable. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, if it's litigated, it can appear unreasonable to the court and the court might document some attorney's fees for that, even mm -hmm. though ultimately the owner didn't comply. So, so it's really, um, really important to try to go through those first steps. I mean, obviously if there's a question about what needs to be done, definitely call the attorney. But mm -hmm. but fulfilling those steps uh, is is definitely um, a good thing to do. But then obviously it's like okay, we've done what we're supposed to do, and they're just not they're just not doing it. We really right. need your assistance. Yep, that would be yep. yeah. Okay, and then legal proceedings. We've got bankruptcy notices. You know, it's it's foreclosures or things like that. We've got liens and threats of liens or even lawsuits. You know, against the board or between residents or neighbor to neighbor. You know that that kind of thing. Insurance claims. We talked about a little bit, but really understanding. You know, kind of. In lots when you get lots of different parties, they kind of all look at each other and expect the other party to do something. And sometimes they need to be told what to do. And sometimes an attorney letter with attorney letterhead kind of motivates them. <clears throat> so yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, that that that's really true. Um, yeah, definitely any type of legal notice, uh, bankruptcies mm -hmm. can can affect what an association can do because of the bankruptcy stage. So it's important. It's like ooh, bankruptcy notice. Stop the stop the delinquency letters. Stop the uh, violation notices. Mm -hmm. Contact the attorney. Um, you know, with any litigation, there's deadlines also involved. So that's mm -hmm. important to um, get in front of the attorney so they can protect the association's interests. 
um, mm -hmm. talked about the in there, there's a statute of limitations deadline. That's one of the bullet points. The statute of limitations is the amount of time that a plaintiff has to make a claim against the other party. Mm -hmm. And so let's just talk about collections for a second. In Washington, it's three years for condominiums and then for HOAs, it's six years. Mm -hmm. So um, as you move forward in, in time, you lose the right to collect those assessments that are three years or older. Uh, I'm sorry, older than three years for condos or older than six years for HOA. So mm -hmm. the association is losing its ability to, uh, to collect. Okay. Um, yeah, so those are, you know, those are really important things to look out for. Uh, resale certificates and seller disclosures, um, property managers and boards, this update, it's, it's important to update those things, particularly if you're aware of damages or huge repairs to the buildings that um, you know, potentially there might be a, a um, special assessment, but obviously would impact a, a prospective buyer. It's important to disclose those things. Um, there's mm -hmm. other things that need to be disclosed, like uh, pending litigation. So uh, it's always good to contact the attorney. Hey, can you help us um, uh, with the resale cert mm -hmm. and make sure it provides the information needed? Okay. What about what about squatters or somebody's kind of broken in and they're inside? Is that more of a police issue to kick them out, or is that called the attorney because we have to deal with them specifically? Are there rules around that? You know, I'm thinking major metropolitan areas, somebody's broken in and they're just living there. Yeah, yeah, those are you know those are interesting and they're also kind of complicated issues. Mm -hmm. Um, so the you know I guess the first question is you know the owner. Obviously, it's a vacant property. Is you know, mm -hmm. it seems like um, the the uh, owner can be. It's a bur huge burden to the association because the owner is the one who is really responsible for like a quiet title action to have them removed or mm -hmm. um, some other form of um, legal action where you know a writ is issued and the sheriff can come in and remove the squatter. It's mm -hmm. a little bit more difficult for the association. It it um, depends on what provisions are available in the governing documents, but it's, you know, it's also really ex expensive. So it's kind of a, the plan of attack could depend on, you know, like I said, the provisions, how much, you know, the association wants to allocate. Um, unfortunately, I've seen um, law enforcement really not having the resources to respond. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, occasionally they will, um, but it's it's been very difficult uh, and it's put a huge extra burden on associations that can be very expensive. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. OK, yeah, is a tent is a tent city up in the woods on your property. Is that similar? It's not quite in somebody's unit, but, um, you know, there's there's some problems over it's, in the corner a, of the yeah, property. Yeah, it's allowing it's allowing um, it's like a temporary residence on the right. property, and those are usually restricted by the governing documents. So, I mean, you could cite, you know, you could cite the owner and try to compel the owner to have mm -hmm. to take care of this situation, and and have the squatters or the temporary encampment um, removed. Mm -hmm. removed from the property um but it's not an easy or quick process right um and right. it's not inexpensive okay buy and sell tips the uh so i'm buying into the community i'm a buyer and so ask for the reserve study read it that's the budget thing saying so you got to save this much for a new roof in five years. Are you going to save this much? Or you are either properly funded, you have enough money in the bank to cover, you know, the planned projects that you think you should have. Or you don't. You're operating totally at a negative. And anytime we need to turn around and order toilet paper for the lobby bathrooms, we're going to be assessing you. So, and then another big red flag, if it comes back, oh, I haven't had one in one. <laughs> There's rules saying you need to do them. Uh, and it's again along that budgeting cycle of are we on track? Is this reasonable? Do we have money in the bank? Do I want to buy into a community that has a negative reserve study or just out of control reserve study where they can't find it and haven't done it in a while? That's a buyer tip. 
um, but another bar to ask for and read the last three meeting minutes from the board meetings. That'll be 90 days on a normal 30 day cycle. And you'll be able to see, hey, here's what we're talking about. Here's what we're struggling with. You can filter out all the, you know, unit number 201's cat got out and chased the bird. And, yeah, but at least you might also get some flavor of it. Of, oh, my cats. At least they didn't shoot the cat. So you'll see some meeting minutes and it's, it's, you'll get a flavor for what they're talking about. If the meeting minutes are full of, we're talking to J2 about their two year inspection process and they're looking at a significant strip and reply because of structural damage and all sorts of things, you'll see this coming. And so, you know, you'll, and I'll get into that in a second, but you just kind of gives you a flavor for what's happening. Um, as a buyer and even as a seller, and I guess the seller is the last bullet. Well, next bullet. As a buyer, check the seller disclosure form. It's called Form 17. And ask the manager as well for any knowledge of special assessments, claims, litigation, or other known projects on the horizon. That Form 17 keeps changing. It used to say, are there any known litigation? Is there any lit litigation pending? Now they say, is there any known projects or known things coming up? Here's the difference. So I've, I've seen it. I've seen people say, you know what? Um, I, as a board member, uh, I've been working for two years with the building envelope consultant. I know this is coming. I'm going to quit the board. I'm going to sell my unit. Buyer comes in. Board seller says, hey, uh, there's no pending litigation. Okay, fantastic. There's no pending litigation. That's great. So litigation means a lawsuit has been filed. It just says we haven't filed a lawsuit yet. But the meeting minutes show that I, as the board member, are directing all these repair things. And so then, then it comes down to the end of, well, it's technically not an assessment until we vote on it and the vote passes, and then it becomes a uh, an official assessment. So we don't have to tell you that it's an assessment yet until we've had a super vote. So this is, well, known projects. I'm getting bids from contractors for $3 million. Why would I be getting bids if I didn't know it was a project? So that's the tricky thing. Check the seller's closure, make sure if there's any questions in there, and just kind of say, hey, I want a little bit more information. Or let me get something out of the manager. Hey, do we know anything about this? Uh, maybe attend. Uh, I've seen sellers attend board meetings or HOA meetings and just get a flavor for is this group positive or negative or are they you know getting along things like that. So as a seller, that's the fourth bullet. Know about pending things before you check any box because you may not know about it because you haven't attended any meetings and any you know events, so you don't know about it. But it's coming and it's in every agenda of the town hall the agenda of the special meetings listed right there, you will get sued by the buyer. You knew about this. This was posted on the bulletin board. This was emailed to everybody. You, it's not my problem. You didn't open your email. You knew about this and you said there wasn't any. And so I want you to pay for my assessment. We're seeing that. So um, an interesting, as the seller, often to provide an introduction to your buyer. I've seen a couple, couple of these happen where it's like, you know what? Um, I'm going to introduce you to the to the family. I'm going to introduce you to the clique. Here's the neighbors. Go, pick, you know. Oh, hi, Bob. How are you? Oh, you're selling. How's the move going? Yeah. Well, I, I've already had it. Here's my buyer. This is Steve, and Steve's a good guy, and I want you to introduce them. And so, has to get introduced or offer to get introduced. What a great you know, smoothing the way for that transaction. So, buyer seller tips, watch out, ask around. Okay, repair work stress. Now we get into, hey, this is, if we're doing condominium repairs, we've got all this baseline or this underlying stuff. Now we're going to close the pool. Now we're going to close your decks. Now we're going to wrap your building in shrink wrap. Now the elevators are shut down for repairs, so I can't get outside. The parking lots are taken. We're, you know, just on and on. And that and, and that's 
normal stress we would call of a repair uh, work story. But I have some, you know, a couple of favorite stories that it's, I call it the white shrink wrap story. And this was a nursing home we were working on that wanted the opaque white uh, plastic covering their scaffolding and they were doing it in phases. So it didn't look at like it was all under construction. And the daughter of one of the residents there came out and she was asking, Hey, is there anything you can do about the white plastic on the outside of the scaffolding? And I said, why? Well, my dad, you know, he's, he's 85 and he, he keeps calling me every hour because he lived through the great blizzard of 1952 and he's looking out his window and it's all, it's a whiteout. So he's calling me every hour to make sure I'm home safely and I'm not freezing to death in my car. And so I said, sure. What, what, what unit does he live in? We went up on the scaffolding. He was there staring out his window into the white plastic and we cut a window for him and put in some clear plastic and turned around and he was just all smiles, but it was it was just amazing what, you know, they can't quite put it. And I think that would be dementia. Is that, is that some kind of dementia thinking it was blizzard outside, but. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that is the kind of, of thing that, you know, if you're, if your brain is, you know, going through dementia, it's, it's mm-hmm. really hard to kind of figure out what's going on. People get confused, but mm-hmm. I love that because the compassion there is so amazing because a lot of people would have said, you know, oh, you know, just, stop that Tough, one. deal with you it know. you know yeah really Who your cares? Drinks. we got a job to do right. um but you know the fact that you kind of put yourself in that guy's shoes and in the daughter's shoes too because it's when you're caretaking right. for an elder as as i am you know you watch them suffer when you know so few people actually seem to really care about that and right. it means a lot when you can do that kind of thing well, we we like it just as a simple example of it. It's actually kind of simple. Once you just learn just a little bit more, I mean, there, it's very simple to say, is this something that I can do that's, that takes really five minutes that really makes that person's anxiety go down? And it's some people may have a giant $10,000 <clears throat> dollars request, but you know, <laughs> figuring out what these things are and, and deciding what you can do is a as a board or a construction team to really, hey, we can we can handle this. This is easy. Yeah. So <clears throat> the other one involved a little bit more money, but it was interesting about uh, we had a we had a resident that was just very concerned about having anyone in their unit. Mm-hmm. And as part of this, you know, replacing windows, there's workers coming in and putting new windows in and patching things. And and it's even, you know, I look back and it's it's even at least last year, as of last year, it was a requirement. You have to give us a key so that they can mm-hmm. come and go. And so I can just see that person really getting anxious about that. Yeah. And so they portrayed themselves as a hoarder. So you don't want to come into my unit. It's terribly disgusting. Um, and nobody can come in. And so we finally made some headway in trust and it, uh, it became, let's see, I just flipped a slide here. Let me go back one. Uh, it was, <clears throat> we got, we developed trust and realized that she had just a pristine unit and very wonderful lady, just very anxious about having people in. But if she could trust one person, that person would be the bridge. And so the board said, fantastic. Can you just be there with each contractor that goes into their unit? We want to keep this want to help this person. And so even, even to the point of after the job was done, this person needs something, something delivered and set up. And they called asking for us to be that uh, person that would come in with the delivery team. And so, and the board said, yeah, I know it's going to cost extra money. We, you know, but it's not that much. We, we want you to meet them and take care of them. And so it was, it was really cool that the board actually designated some money to, we can, we can do this. We can, we can pay a little service call. We can pay a little extra to figure this out. Are there other examples of maybe how boards could manage some of this? Is there some kind of budget or some kind of, I don't know. I'm going to stay away from budget because that's, that's your area of expertise, but (laughs) um, you know, the more that people know what to expect, the more anxiety goes down, you know, just like you gave the example of the point person and Mm -hmm. the, you know, the lady had actually met that person. So she was putting a face to it. And then it felt Mm -hmm. like, oh, it's just Steve or whoever is is Mm going to come by to help out. 
And yeah, that, that fear of having people come in, the worry about the noise or, or you know, smells, all of those things, it, people, if they just know what to expect and they have a sense of like, when is it going to happen? And a reasonable expectation of like, how long do I have to put up with it? And I, mm-hmm. I always tell people things are going to take longer than mm-hmm. they actually are, because then I get some grace at the end if mm-hmm. it does take longer. And, you know, of course, if it if I turn out to be right and you know snowstorm comes and it takes longer, well, right. then nobody's upset with me. So um, sure. that that communication piece and getting buy in. Mm-hmm. And if, you know, condo boards can have like a meet the contracting company night where mm-hmm. they get, you know, like the, the tenants or um, owners um, and their caretakers, too, because if you, mm. you know, say somebody who's. Yeah, caring for an elder and maybe they come by, you know, three times a week. They want to know about that, too, because they want to know, like, you know, who's coming into the house and what kind of noises and will my father think it's a it's a blizzard. So, you know, not only providing that information and, and faces to go with it, but, you know, remembering that a lot of the folks with either mental health problems or disabilities, they're going to need a lot of reminders. So sure. you may send out an email blast and say, you know, the parking lot will be unusable for the next week. But if you can also remember like, okay, some of our elders won't use email. Some of our folks don't read very well or can't see. We're going to have to find alternate ways to communicate to that, that information to them and probably communicate it a lot, you know, like a week out, um, two days out, and then like right as it's happening. And then people are much calmer just when they know what to expect. So you can save yourself a lot of extra work by putting in the, the you know, stitch in time saves nine work by being proactive about communicating well. Well, inviting the caregiver, that's brilliant because the, the resident's going to be asking the caregiver likely repeatedly. And so as if they're giving an answer instead of, I don't know, let me go find it, but they can reassure and yeah, that's a great, yeah, we'll add that to our thing. Invite the caregivers. Right. Perfect. So the value of consultants, this isn't a shameless plug, but it's the one, one of the, one of the points that I hear people like is a funny, it's a, <clears throat> I don't want to tell my neighbor because they'll hate me. And can I hire you to tell my neighbor the bad news? And so I laugh and I say, baseball managers are hired to be fired, right? So <laughs> there's one, there's one aspect of that. But I think one of the, one of the big things that people uh, seem to overlook is an independent consultant. I, I, I'm not selling you anything. I'm not selling you windows. I'm not selling you roof. I'm not selling you, you know, ask, ask a, you know, unscrupulous roofer if you need a roof. Of course you do. Yeah, you bet. And maybe that doesn't solve all your problems. Um, and then there may be some requirements. Um, Brandy, can you elaborate on the insurance policy limit there? Was that, was that for like a fire loss or? If you look in, um, your declarations, there's a section that discusses insurance. There's an exhibit B that talks about the details of that insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. Most condominium association declarations will say if you've had a catastrophic event to your building, um, fire, hurricane, earthquake, catastrophic events to your building envelope, to your building or the structural condition of your building in excess of $50,000, you are required to have an engineer sign off on those repairs Mm. per the requirements of your declaration. Right. Because and then of course as you know the RCW 6455 has its own requirements for that would be a Washington measure. State statute yeah the Washington State statute has its own requirements of assessed value and then there's just best practice mm-hmm. I think that it's a common uh, misunderstanding that managers know everything you're you're the association manager why do we need an engineer right. this is what you do for a living. An association's manager's specialty is governance, assisting you through governance and who's responsible for what when it comes to the governance of your buildings. Mm -hmm. We're here to guide you towards the proper experts to help you answer the questions that they're specializing in to answer your questions and to build a team for you of consultants, whether it be legal, accounting, engineering, architecture, landscape design, 
don't ask me to pick colors for your building. Don't ask me to get paint colors because I'm not even allowed to pick my own paint colors at my own house. <laughs> I am not the color person. But okay. I need a color consultant. Yeah, and it's you know the training and education of the boards. Uh, that's that's kind of the impetus for the show. And you know we know a lot about party plank siding and roof ventilation and building envelope and things like that. But we've worked with enough boards that that we we said you know let's let's put on some educational topics and get some guest speakers on to talk about this stuff to help our boards. And so. Uh, viewing your consultant maybe is offering some training or some education. That's that's another place where we could help. Uh, and then history, that last bullet, you know, we got a call last week from a customer we worked with in 2007. And so, hey, you know, we've been through a bunch of managers and a bunch of boards, but, uh, you know, one, one, of the, one or two of the board members still live there. And they were like, I remember you. <clears throat> and so we're so glad you have our old file. And just from a business practice, we have, you know, have their old documents, their old reports, their old stuff. Granted, they're 16 years old or whatever they are. But we can say, yeah, sure, we'll put them on a thumb drive for you and you can have them and, and repopulate your, your uh, stuff as well. So anything else you would add to that? I would add the value of a consultant is... In an association like ours, it's approaching 50 years old. The building codes have evolved and changed sure. quite a bit. Um, materials have improved and evolved quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And But the knowledge base of the members of the association probably hasn't evolved. Right the same way um, and to apply new modern materials on a, 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 a to fix something without understanding all the implications of it uh, can't happen without a consultant and uh, you need an architect engineering person involved between a, fixing something with better materials on an old building. Um, and as a board member, even if I had that experience myself, I would counsel an, another board member to get a third party to do that. Sure. Uh, uh, you, you just don't want to put yourself in that position. You yep. need a third party owner's representative so that you can present something or have something presented to your members that can't be questioned. So property manager, I'm hiring a property manager or a community manager. And so I worked in the business for quite a while before I really learned the difference between the two. Um, what, what are your first takeaways, Laura, in, when, when you're distinguishing between those two? I have a couple of things, but. Yeah, I would say for, first off, um, just in case any of you didn't know, uh, community managers do not like to be called property managers. <laughs> so yes. make sure if you are in your HOA or condo um, and you are managed, you want to be calling them a community manager because there is a lot of differences between the two. And I would say a lot of technical differ differences Mm -hmm. um, such as knowing, um, you know, down to your bylaws and your CCNRs and then, and then also recognizing what are all the laws and legal stuff you have to follow as a community manager. There's a lot there. So, um, the two have a lot, have a lot of very specific differences. Right. I did. I did get that lecture. I said, you know, I, I got the finger wave. I got I've gotten wave. it too. I totally and, got it too. And, uh, we don't deal with pools. And sports courts. Right. And I was like, oh, wow. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> but when you're you, touching on something sensitive. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, wow. But you do hear, you know, property managers are dealing with leasing. They're dealing with turnovers. They're dealing with site amenities and pools. And, and then in kind of the commercial world, they're definitely more spreadsheet and budget decision oriented. You know, it's not on this year's budget. I can't do that. I know the roof is leaking. I don't have authority, you know. Whereas a community manager is really kind of a leader or a guide with yeah. your board. They know what you need to do, but they understand your board has a little bit of a different set of bylaws or a different, 
you know, this, this community has a different melody or a different feel. We, we, we still tax ourselves and penalize ourselves and write tickets and do that sort of thing. But, but we're leading our way through this. And I think, I think they have a lot more project management experience as well than in apartment property managers, yes. you know, kind of thing. Um, I think, I think even in the bigger firms that do both, you'll see community association firms and property management firms, and you'll have some other firms that kind of do both. I've found they have different departments and different staff and yes. different email addresses and different, I mean, they really keep them separate. Yeah. I know in Washington, I'm not sure about Oregon or Utah, but, but just look into the real estate act in Washington, you actually have to be a licensed broker to be a property manager. And so that caused some kerfuffle and the community managers went through the legal action committee or, or whatever that's called through CAI and mm -hmm. said, we want this kind of modified a little bit. And now the mo now rule modifications do say community managers do not need to be licensed brokers because yeah. they're not doing so much leasing and, and, and very mm -hmm. specific things like that. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there's all sorts of groups for landlords and short-term rentals. So if you're a board member that's trying to rent out their rent out their or Airbnb, their unit, um, you know, go, go find another group. You'll, you'll hear about condominium management and board support in this webinar, but there's specific ones for you in, in the sense of landlord tenant act and um, more landlord groups than have legislation. But, but this, this stuff is about boards today. Um, and I think the last thing, you know, a good community manager, there's a lot of keeping you out of trouble and keeping you in compliance with ever changing updates. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be had there. Did I, did I kind of miss anything or anything else you'd add to that? I I feel like um, also community managers definitely attend a lot of evening meetings. Yeah, <laughs> um, because the board meet the board meetings are usually at night. So um, if you have your community manager, they're going to be involved in all of those meetings as well. So um, they really are. That was a good good word to use as they are a guide for your, yeah. your community. Yeah, they've they've the good ones have been there and done that, and they can show you how to do it. So they're here to help you. Um, I think, you know, guide like a coach, well, coach sometimes yells at you and makes mm -hmm. you do stuff. Um, they can't make you make you do stuff, but they can encourage and, and motivate. And, and we've had other shows with other managers on talking about that, but right. kind of the difference between the two, we wanted to start our thing with property management versus community management. Think of apartment versus uh, kind of community home. It's it's more complex. There's there's owners in here, and there's uh, there's lots of owners in here instead of just one owner with a spreadsheet somewhere. So, emergency drills. Here we go. What's the first thing if you if you've ever been on a cruise? What's the first thing they do? It's called the lifeboat drill. Understanding where the lifeboat is. Where are the life jackets? Uh, it's the same with airplanes. You don't leave the runway or you don't leave the airport uh, until they've gone through their safety thing. Here's where the oxygen is. Here's the life jackets. Here's how to put on your seatbelt. So it's it's emergency drills and it's understanding how how and what we need to do for our building. And this is kind of part of this. And it's fire drills in school, right? Emergency drills. So during this back to school planning, it's great to run through it again. So here's what we're planning for. We're preparing for leaks and other emergencies. So what does that mean? Well, if I if the wind blows and I get a big branch through the roof, uh, wouldn't it be nice to have a tarp? Or wouldn't it be nice to have some kind of thick roll of plastic? Or maybe a couple of sheets of, you know, half-inch ply, plywood or OSB. You know, what, what happens if we get some more protests and we get a brick through the front door? If we had a piece of plywood there handy, in the in the uh, you know fire sprinkler room or or wherever you got a little extra room for a few extra supplies, some plywood, some nails, some duct tape, uh, maybe some cones or something to kind of block off an area just in case there's you know there's some kind of damage or leaks. I can tell you for sure if you tried to buy ice melt 
the morning of the first snow, forget it. You can't even find it. So it's the same with snow shovels. Same with every time the wind blows, uh, the tarps are sold out. So get those things together, you know, tarp and rope and staple gun, you know, basic stuff, plywood, cones, supplies. Who is the go-to person in your community? Every community has a contractor or a handyman or maybe just somebody that's handy. They've got hammers and ladders and screwdrivers and maybe make a call and just say, hey, would you be our emergency, not, not the emergency response guy, but can we call you if we get a rock through the window or a little bit of a, a little bit of a wind blow off? And most of the, most of the time they'd be like, yeah, sure. But don't wait for the morning of, don't wait for the evening of. And so comments here, you know, get as prepared as you want to get. You can go to you know, the FEMA website, you know, we just saw the catastrophe of these fires, especially in Maui of, wow, what, what would a little extra water around do or a little extra, you know, food? I, you know, I'm not saying you need to be the, the place that, that helps everybody, but just think about it for a second, maybe a first aid kit, obviously a fire extinguisher. Do you want to get those, you know, chest thumper things? What do you call them? The thing on the wall, the you know, do you want to get trained in that? Does the board want to take some safety training? Those, So that's preparing for emergencies. Okay. So the next thing you want to do is your mechanical and furnace and electrical and things like that. HVAC checkups for maintenance, HVAC, heating, venting, air conditioning. You're, you know, the furnace has been turned off all summer. The air conditioner and the heat pump has been working all summer. And so... You know, again, if you've had a lot of forest fire smoke or dust, let's change those filters. Let's get this serviced. Again, it's, it's, let's not wait for it to break in the middle of the night on a freeze. And then I can't get a technician out there because the roads are too icy. And so it's just kind of thinking about it. Let's do some checkups and maintenance. Um, you know, sometimes the furnace flues get bird nests in them because there's nothing, you know, the furnace is off. So the birds build a nest in there. And the second the hot air turns on, it can start a fire. And so you'll want to get that figured out. Um, next thing, uh, freeze control. So, we're, you know, that's, it, that's a couple months off, but let's start talking about our exterior hose bibs. Do we have those frost free hose bibs or do we got to get those styrofoam? We call them hose bib boobs. You know, the things you get at Ace that, you cover the cover the thing and they got a little strap in it, but they keep the hose bib from freezing. And so we want those, uh, your sprinklers, both your fire and your landscaping. Have those been drained? Do they need to be drained and bled or air bleed, you know, whatever. Do you need to have a vendor come out and do that stuff to start, start thinking, you know, freezing weather could be as soon as October. Um, it just depends on where you're at. So we're four weeks from that, right? Okay. So snow and ice, we talked about that, trying to buy a snow shovel and ice melt the day of snowstorm, forget about it. So where is the snow shovel? Last time we used it, there was a snowy day and it got put in the closet and I don't know where it is. How's that snow melt or the salt, you know, those things you buy, you can get it now, uh, probably on sale, Labor Day sales, uh, but I guarantee you won't get it the first day it snows. So do we have an extra jug of that? Can we make it for like three days and we can go get resupplied? Um, do you have a snow removal sub? So somebody is going to come plow the plow the uh, parking lot and street access. Uh, maybe agree on a cost now. If you're trying to negotiate that cost on day of snow, forget about it. It'll be triple. And so... Maybe get something in place. Hey, you know, we want you to do it. We're going to call you. What's the price? Great. We'll agree on a price. Let's get that done. So we don't we want it agreed now so we don't get storm gouged. So uh, what about walk-off mats? It's raining or icy or snowy and we're stomping and trying to get our get that junk off our shoes, but we walk into the slippery lobby. Uh, you know, you don't need them so much in the summer, but make sure you got those rubber mats or walk-off carpets in the entries, especially if you got slick uh, floors. Another thing to think about is security lighting. Hey, in the summer, it's light till 930. 
And so now as it starts getting darker sooner, the garage is going to be darker. The, you know, Hey, there was some light bulbs that burned out this summer. We haven't replaced them yet. Uh, we got to remember to check those auto timers. You know, it's like in the uh, spring, it's like, where are the lights coming on at four 30? It's, it's light out till seven. Oh, that's right. Winter time, four 30. I got to reset that. So you got to do the same thing coming back now. So the stairs are lit. The pathways are lit. Uh, everything is working well. So mechanical checkups, freeze control, snow and ice way to deal with them, security lighting, auto timers, you know, just kind of stuff like that. Think about emergency preparedness. Future proofing. This is where we're talking about maintenance cycles. And if it's, if it's, gonna be wet and collecting water and all that stuff let's let's make it as low maintenance as possible so good design doesn't have to just look good you know it can last a lifetime and save you on maintenance fees and energy things like that so waterproofing of course we're focused on with with this water intrusion causing the damage in the original place so we're going to give you a good waterproofing design but energy efficiency still remains a big thing and the code continues to drive uh, the energy code, which more insulation, thicker windows or air, more tight is what I'm trying to say. Tighter windows that don't leak as much air. Uh, but you get better sound quality. You get better insulation, uh, noise reduction. A lot of people are adding, you know, hey, this didn't have AC and I don't want a window mounted AC. Can you give me some kind of clean port? that I can have a portable air conditioner, plug that hose into, and it goes to the outside. And on the outside, that port just looks like a dryer vent or something. And we can close it off, make a little door inside. But that way you don't have all these ACs in windows or hoses sticking out or, you know, kind of running all over the place. Um, the the pictures we have there, that's a that's a thermal image where you can see darker spots, which is actually, this is a stucco building. You can see the darker spots where the stucco is holding some water against the building. But then, then you have some hot spots of letting heat through, whether the insulation was a little crooked or missing. Uh, but you can see some kind of interesting anomalies there. And what we found in that building was a lot of water damage through the stucco and it was a five-year-old building. So, um, you know, just a, just a waterproofing issue there and the lower lower uh you can see the snow gathering there's no head flashings there's no flashings around beams the railings are you know they're big bulky timber railings but they're not per code um so and everything needs staining and painting and refinishing and and all that stuff so um we can we can make some of these exterior elements better even though we're we're replacing them anyway, let's make them better and more efficient. Anything to add to that? Nope. There's a lot there. Every city is different. So what goes through in, you know, in Bellingham may not pass in Utah or Seattle. Um, so I think that, you know, the energy mm -hmm. efficient co efficiency codes are, are different in each jurisdiction. So mm -hmm. there's a little bit of research that needs to be done before anything gets ordered or specified. So what your your neighbor or your family member might have might not work in the city that you are located in. So it's just something to keep in mind right. as well. Yeah. And different different climates, different exposures on the waterproofing side of things. Obviously, Pacific Northwest is, is a little different than, than uh, our Utah locations as far as dry climate. But Utah has lots of ski resorts, so they get lots of precipitation every year. And, um, so it's, you do get precipitation. You, maybe you don't get driving rain or soaking rain, or you got plenty of time to dry it out, but exposure would be another issue of, are you on the beach kind of getting blasted by the, uh, you know, Pacific ocean, or are you tucked back in a hollow somewhere and protected from all this wind? Are you on the top of a mountain or are you on a big lake? You know, all these different different locations and exposures require some uh, thought as well. Occupied remediation. We've got some misconceptions. We're gonna kind of approach some of these as misconception versus reality. So 
occupied remediation. There's going to be constant noise and traffic. The building will be uninhabitable or dangerous. Uh, we got to tear the whole building down. No, those are, you know, those are misconceptions. We've got, you've got, you know, uh, water damage walls under windows, lots of, I think this is even in a shower. Uh, but here's an interesting building that we, that we, uh, this is the one we had to condemn. And you'll see it looks like two, we call them the Farmer, Farmer Brown Red Barns. Well, they actually were. They were original barns to the land. And HOA came in and, and put in state-of-the-art uh, library, a library inside this barn. And it was a wonderful story, other than the sad ending, uh, that they didn't check out the shell or the existing barn and it happened to be uh, since since the timbers from the barn were actually harvested from the farmland around, they weren't pressure treated or kiln dried, which would kill the post powder post beetle. And so the powder post beetle was in the timber, woke up about five years later and proceeded to eat little holes all the way through things. And uh, we the exterior structure had to be torn down. And so the Here's the, everybody likes a good demolition. Here's what happens. We take track hose and we tear apart your building. Yeah. And we fly a drone around it just because it's fun. But yikes, this was really sad. And so here they're smashing through the conference rooms in the library and tearing out, you know, really neat children's areas. Just like it, it, you walk into this bar and then you walk through a door and it, dee, dee, you know, had the automatic little dinger on the door, like a so the security to make sure you weren't stealing books. A really cool place, but tore this down and, and they're in the process of rebuilding. So the one building we've had to send to the morgue. Now, other other things, um, you know, noise and traffic being constant. Now we work with contractors to sort that out. Uh, your entire site is not a war zone. The contractor says, look, I want to start on building one and work my way around counterclockwise. Um, or they give us, you know, we're going to start here and go there and go there. We're not going to tear everything apart. Um, and then, you know, 98% of the repair projects we work on, uh, we really try hard to keep people from moving out, keep you in your units so that you can enjoy your units and not incur additional expense. There's some times where, you know, a big plumbing replacement job, maybe the bathroom's going to be shut down for a couple of days, and maybe that's when you need to stay in a hotel. But uh, for the most part, we call it, we can, if we need to shore up your building, we can put it on crutches. So that's called temporary shoring, big posts and beams and even steel and, and whatever to keep your building from collapsing. Okay, there's the... Okay, the, yeah, the, the reality of this, we're not always tearing things down. Here's, here's J2 in a, in a, you know, in a vest and working with the contractor here who's measuring some things out. We're wearing booties, uh, keeping things clean and, and uh, you know, letting you live in your home. And so good, good communication is a big part of that. But for this slideshow, you know, we had to include the black cat. You got to have the black cat on a Halloween uh, presentation. So there's the black kitty. And here's occupied remediation. We're talking about this. You'll find this video. We're on talking website. about people that live in their home while all of this demolition and repair work is going on on the outside. And it it's chaotic. There's nothing nice about it. There's no simple way to put it. You're living in an active construction zone. So having the right team that at least respects the fact that people live here is very important. And having a good contractor that can work with homeowners or deal with somebody that's got a dog or a cat, it's all important. You know, we take these things for granted when we're doing new construction because we don't have to deal with them. But occupied remediation, this is somebody's home and we have to respect that. Okay. Let's see. Here's here's some more stuff of you know how are you gonna get this is a this is on our YouTube channel. I'm not gonna play the whole video. 
But in this particular project, we're redoing the walkways in between these buildings. And so in order to get the columns in there, we had to have this gigantic crane. Um, and, but we were able to do everything within a single day. We didn't, you know, we didn't lose any, didn't lose any uh, people having to face the walkways. So this video isn't all all that exciting, but it's, it's cool. The drones and the big cranes and the stuff we can do. And so we can go to great lengths to make that easy for you. Staying out of trouble. <laughs> and so these are just kind of my quick bullets, you know, follow the rules and the bylaws, including notices and timing issues. And, and we, we, We've talked, you know, given you examples about this of, you know, you didn't, you didn't conduct that vote right. So you can't assess me or you, you know, you just called this meeting out of the blue, but actually meetings require three weeks notice and time, you know, 60 days and this and that, you know, follow your rules and a good, good manager is helping you do that. Um, act reasonable, that business reasonableness of the, of the volunteer board member. Um, just, I, I'm listening to advice. Nobody expects you to be a lawyer or a contractor or a consultant. Uh, but, but you do need to listen to them. If, if they've given you written advice and you ignore it, then of course you're kind of operating outside of that. Um, communicate and share this, you know, don't hide. I, I cringe when I talk to boards and they say, well, we don't have to tell people this. And I was like, <laughs> It's not that you don't have to share the stuff, share it. Hey, we're working on this. We don't have the answer yet. We're trying. Here's what we're going through. We're There's a process. It's going to take six months, but here's the initial results of our investigation. Here's the report that we got. We're giving this out, to, you know, or talk to your attorney about what gets disclosed, but communicate and share is usually the better route. Um, the, the longer you wait to tear the bandaid off, the more it hurts. And so when you're delivering news to your owners, and by you, I'm assuming that you're a manager or you're a condo board member, the longer you wait to deliver bad news, right. the more likely it is that in addition to being upset about the bad news, the owners are going to feel like there was some effort to conceal the bad news, even if there right. wasn't. Right. And so the longer I do this, and this is especially true for these special assessment deferred maintenance projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I tell my clients, look, maybe you got a report, but you don't have a bid yet. Right. You know, invite the consultant, invite me to a meeting to talk to the owners about it. It's okay to say that you don't have all of the information. Mm -hmm. What the owners want to hear is that you're working towards a solution. But the longer you wait to tell people that generally speaking, the angrier they are going to be. Um, yep. There's a good good phrase. Conflict deferred is conflict magnified. There you go. That's uh, a good one. Yeah, just uh, talk about it. Um, next one. Take the high ground as much as you want to clap back. I mean, <laughs> this, uh, this you know clapping back and arguing and fighting only pours gas on the fire. Um, you, you you will find the community supporting you. They understand you're taking a few arrows. That's the job of the board. They're supposed to be able to have a thick enough skin to be able to do that. Um, they're not going to let you, you know, take withering fire, but, uh, you know, try, try to just be positive. And I know that, that everybody has a capacity for that, but as much as you can do that, do that. Um, have your lawyer and manager involved, even if not in a claim, you know, why, why is the lawyer here? There's no lawsuit. Well, we just want to make sure we're doing it right and not ending up in a lot, you know, staying out of trouble is, is better than having an ounce of prevention is much less expensive than a pound of cure. <laughs> That's yeah. another good reason. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's keep from needing to save the day versus saving the day. Let's keep from needing to save the day. Uh, you know, we're we're working way ahead of this and staying out of trouble.